Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. What's happening, guys? Welcome back to another show. This week's guest is Thomas Rusink. Uh, Thomas is, uh, well, just till very recently, was a skills coach at PSV Eindhoven. And look, this is like another top, top podcast that we've been so lucky to have all these guests on recently and all the way through the shows. And some one of the reasons I started this podcast was to learn, particularly from coaches from other cultures, cultures, and particularly, you know, I really like the, you know, the uh, Dutch football culture. Obviously, the Holland is home to. Will Cover, who created the Cover method, and really where ball mastering one v one came from. So obviously, yeah, Thomas talks about his work at PSV as a skills coach, starting first in the tens and twelves, and then in the thirteens. But talks about his, the ball mastery, and he became really a specialist in chaos games, small sided chaos games. So we're interested to hear about his, his journey. Really intelligent, thoughtful guy. Obviously, a top top coach at one of the, you know the top academies in world football. So really good to get some real quality insight there and uh, really privileged that he agreed to come on the show and before he goes off to his next uh, coaching adventure and just uh, just about to have a big announcement on the the coaches pass um, so the club partnership another cat one club about to sign up hope to tell you about that in the next couple of weeks but remember if you want to set up a demo for the uh, my personal football coach uh, club partnership as used by some of the top academies in the world and also used by grassroots clubs all around the world set up a free demo just drop me a line obviously all the players get the app and the coaches get the coaches pass you can set players uh, challenges from the app you can check the data so there's nothing else like that like it out there so uh, like I said we can set up a free demo uh, but without further ado let's get into the show so Thomas Rusink welcome to the show thank you can you give us a brief um, outline of your playing and coaching journey up to this point please well I was born in, uh, in one of those rural villages in Holland uh, I played all my life in a small amateur club. I am that typical player who has the eye. I have the overview. I have the left foot. I have the passing. But my body is not really necessarily elite playing quality. I can't run. So my playing career was quite easy. It was 16. And then I decided I'm not a good player. I'm not going to be reaching the level I want to reach as a player. And then I got into coaching quite early on. I think I was 14 coaching little four-year-olds. And I realized that this is really fun which is a little bit weird of course because the four-year-olds are not that easy um mm. after that i was there and then my I, I went to the graph shop which is a professional club in holland one of the uh, the clubs who's always going up and down i was there for about 10 years uh started to be a teacher my playing career at that time was ended already i still played for fun but i didn't play any professional or any uh high level amateur anymore then uh, after 10 years at the grass shop, I went to the Middle East. I worked three years for the Aspire Academy, which is the uh, Qatar Football Association like academy scheme. Uh, after that, I went. I returned to Holland. I worked uh, three and a half years at PSV Eindhoven, uh, which I'm just done. Okay, wow, cool. Yeah, lovely. So let's. Um, so, so you mentioned you're a teacher there as well. So how long did you do your teaching degree? Did I you teach as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't teach really because at the time I was doing my uh, education. And yeah. at that time, I, when I was about to make the decision, am, am, I, am I going to pursue a career as a, as a football coach, which is not a career because it's, it's a passion, it's not work, it's what I yeah. love to do, or, should yeah. I, or, or is it going to be a teacher? And at that time, the grass shop offered me a full-time coaching position, which was, oh, uh, wow. which was like, that was like perfect timing. So at that time, I decided this is what I want to pursue. When I was 15... No, when I was about 18, I did travel to the US. And that's when I realized that I, I was coaching for six weeks nonstop almost. That's when I realized that even after six weeks, this is what I really love to do. And of course, mm. I really did enjoy teaching. But in teaching, I did not enjoy teaching them math. But I did enjoy yeah. teaching them the social skills and stuff like that. So at that yeah, time, yeah. already, I was happy that I could combine the combination of being, a, being an educator, being a teacher with, with football. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot, a lot, you get more and more people from education background now in football, which is like myself. I did, I was teaching and then did academy football and then sort of transitioned into full time. It's quite interesting. So tell us about that first full time job you got. What was the club's name again? That, uh, the, the Graph Shop. 
the Grafschap. So well, quite unique. pronounced in Dutch, the Grafschap, which is uh, very yeah. difficult. Yeah. yeah we want to wanna... stick to the English one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, tenth, so, tenth, so that's a, that was a full-time position then. That's that was a full-time so position, but I was actually quite lucky because it was a, at that time we had a little, uh, they just started with the U12s and they were looking for someone who could coach the U12s. When I say full-time position, this is time-wise. This is not salary-wise, yeah. of course, right, okay. which, is, which is, I think, which is the reality for a lot of people. You work a lot of hours, but the money is not uh, uh, the equivalent of the, the hours you put in. But to me, yeah. I was quite lucky because I was living in a, I was living quite close to the club. There was no any investment financially wise. So it was it was just a, a great combination. So I was coaching the U12s and I was in charge of the, we call them the elite schools, which was for kids who were like uh, average in the amateur club. They would come to the graph shop to do twice a week a session. Uh, yeah. So that was my job. And I was, of course, I was with the 18s and the 16s. I was with all the ages trying to get as much experience as I could. And is that was that a pro club or semi pro club or it is a, it, it's a pro, it, it is a professional club and it right. is in the it's like in between the top tier and the second tier in Holland it always goes up right. and down yeah uh, okay it, it's not one of those stable clubs so either yeah. they get promoted or they get relegated so there's always yeah, something okay. happening so it's always political stuff it's yeah. always, uh, the the change of play is changing so it's, it's it was a quite quite good start. And so tell us about then you reflecting looking back what are the main things you remember about the challenges of you know being on the grass and taking those sessions and that sort of thing to begin with. I remember that I had to, uh, I had to, I was, I was realizing that as soon as you're on the pitch in a professional club, it's different than, uh, cause I worked in the U S where the kids had paid money to come. I worked in amateur clubs where the demands of the people around you are not that high. The kids just come to have a good time to enjoy themselves. Being in that environment, it was different because no one is really demanding only fun. It's also demanding on, how you can implement a type of philosophy from the club, but also how can you make sure that the kids actually do get better, that they actually perform better, that the level goes up. So I felt that that it, it was not necessarily pressure, but I felt that requirement from coming from the players also that you need to step up your game. So it was a it was a challenging environment when I was a young coach. And what was the philosophy of that club at the time? What was the like the methodology and what sort of it sessions a, were we putting on? It was a, it was a uh, it was curve based especially 14s and younger. And at the time I came in, Curva was still, it was uh, the, the guy I worked with called Wim van Zeist. He was a, he was, and he was a strong believer in Curva. And he honestly took it to the point where, where it was like, you, you remember the Egypt DVDs when they were in Egypt doing all the drills. It was that time. It was isolated. It was a little bit of resistance. It was a little bit of one V ones, but it was isolated. It was a lot of fast foot work. It was dribbling two cones. It yeah. was doing the cross and stuff like that. So I think that's where I, uh, uh, I really learned what it was like when you coach from a certain specific point. And then by the time I left, it changed. It went more into, it was a combination of, uh, of a little bit of the Dutch old soccer school with the 4v4 and everything you play when you learn when you play and you just play 4v4 games and stuff like that. So it, it, it modified a little bit to that. But I still think the base, my core, is still that individual uh, ability to control the ball to dominate the body and to dominate the space yeah interesting because obviously you know we have cova coaching over here um but obviously holland's the, the home of cova obviously will will cova they the created it and i've had Rennie millenstein on the show obviously i worked lucky enough to yeah. work ricardo moniz at tottenham for when i was there so just tell us a bit about because there's like you know different people have different ways of you know it's, it's a broad like umbrella isn't it cova like lots, there's, there's yeah. many people doing different things within it Tell us a bit about your experiences in there. You talked about, you know, the very isolated work. Just tell us a little bit more, like give us some practical, you know, detail what your sort of stuff is delivering. I, uh, what session looked like, for example. Yeah, when I was when I was starting, I think uh, around 10 years ago, my session would be like we would start with fast footwork. We would do all the uh, roll the ball and on the balls of your feet, all those type of moves. We would do that for about 20 minutes. We would do 10 the same ones and we would do maybe five new ones. Then that would be the homework for the next week. Then yeah. the next step would be uh, anywhere in between, like a race. You would do uh, new moves, and then whoever scored the first goal wins. So it's a post, but not a post as you can actually get the ball from the opponent, like like shadow play, stuff yeah. like that. And then we would progress into a one v one where the attacker could just score a goal. The defender would pass to the attacker. I think the basic curve stuff. But if you look at my sessions now, also realizing that 
the game is changing a little bit. It's more decision making. And the decision is not only what move am I going to do, but also the timing of that move. And mm -hmm. having, having the, uh, the base of all these different types of moves, but the timing of when to use what move is more important, I think, uh, looking back than what I've put all the emphasis on. I was putting my emphasis on doing the, the move correctly. Now it's more about, uh, we try to put them in a high intensity environment where they have to make the right decision, where, what move are they going to do? When are they going to do what move? And do they have to do a move? So the focus changed a little bit. It's still, I, think, I still think it's curver because it's based on the skill. The skill, if you don't have the skill, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. If you see the fish, but you can't get the fish, then what are you going <laughs> to do with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting because, yeah, I mean, I, I think that as well, you know, my through my 20 years of delivering and I started doing that, you know, that COVID type stuff. And, you know, people say to me, oh, your stuff you do, it's just COVID. So well, it's not really, if you look at some of the stuff, COVID soccer schools, no disrespect to them. It's amazing. It's great what they do, but what we've done, you know, what I've learned around the, my, the environments I've done and project is a little bit different. Like you say, it's much more detail, much more based actually around the one V one and the detail around the one V one and breaking that down. And sort of, I've been that journey myself. So tell us about your own journey then. How did that happen that where you, you realized, was it just the experience of seeing, okay, actually work? Cause as you know, my sort of epiphany came when I started working in the elite environments. You work with those top players all the time. You're seeing those the day in, day out, and they're challenging you. You're challenging them. You really progress and understand things a bit more. What was what was it, your journey like in that particular aspect? Yeah, th th that was a that was a that was a different story because I moved. I was I moved to the Middle East. I didn't speak Arabic, and these kids in the, in the Middle East they are really focused on winning. When I came, I, I tried to do the stuff I was doing in Holland. I was trying to do the stuff I did when I was traveling coaching. It just didn't work. It was it was 90%. It was not really in it. So I had to find a way to where the, the players would be more engaged. So I went into more uh, races. I went more into a 2v1 uh, chaos types of games. More implicit learning where I didn't have to speak. Because in the beginning, I didn't speak any Arabic, of course. Uh, after a year, I spoke it. So that, that helped, of course. But in that beginning, I had to find ways where I could uh, put rules in the game, constraints, where the kids would actually do the things I wanted them to do and learning the things I wanted them to learn. But it should still be in a challenging environment where it was always 2v1. There, was always, there would always be a goal. There would always be a winner. There would always be a loser. So that's when I realized if I see the power and the, the engagement of the players now within those exercises, what if I were to do that in the elite environment? So when I left the Middle East and I went to PSV and I tried to do the chaos uh, exercises there, it's crazy chaos as the players would call it. I could see that the kids, are, they, they were very into it. So what I didn't do now, my session would now be 10 minutes of fast footwork, 10 minutes of isolated stuff, 10 minutes of unopposed. Then we would go into 2v1s, 3v2s, 1v1s, 2v2s, overload, underload, uh, equal numbers, 2v2 with two balls with seven goals, with four goalkeepers. Uh, so I realized that the variety is more important than just the variety within just the skills exercises. It's also yeah. about, it's, 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 the variety. it's like the routines is a, is a challenge for the boys. If you always do the same uh, layout, it's like, especially with the youngest generation of players, we lose them. So now mm. my session is like when you go to a restaurant, you start with the dessert, then you do the main course, and then you do the starter. That's what you'd never do, but I would do it in the sessions. We would start with the little match. We would do some 2v1s. We would go isolated, unopposed, match. So it's, I think it's important with the younger players, with the new generation, that it's not only one thing, and it's not always predictable. I think it's important that we can challenge them also mentally by changing it up all the time. Yeah, interesting. So just winding back a bit, how did that, how did you get the job at Aspire in the Academy, the Aspire Academy? How did that come about? I did my UEFA B license. I was, uh, the, we were asked to uh, tell us about the ambitions and I am one of those, I think it's, it has to do with my background as a teacher. Uh, that, that I've never been shy talking to people. I've never been shy talking to parents. I could always find a way, even if I wasn't prepared, I could say something. So I looked prepared. I was getting too comfortable working in a Dutch environment. It was too structured. It was too easy. So I, I was looking for a challenge to the point where I couldn't communicate with the kids because I think my, my biggest strength as a coach is that I, it's easy for me to relate to kids. It's easy to help 
that they understand that I want to help them. So to work in an environment where the language is not just not there, where the culture is completely different, that's what I was looking for. So I spoke to, I spoke, that's my ambition, what I told uh, the conductor from the course. And he actually knew that a guy in the Middle East was looking for a coach, a Dutch coach to take over uh, the U9s because they don't speak English. So it was perfect for me. There was a Japanese guy working who I worked with in the uh, Middle East. He mentioned my name. I actually been to Qatar because I had a friend, a Scottish friend who was a teacher there. So I, t I, I taught for two weeks there. So I was like, this is it. I'm going to go. So I signed without thinking about it for one hour. I just signed the contract. And I, I think I had three months to prepare myself and I went. And then what was it like then? You turn up in Qatar. What was the main, what were the main differences between coaching there and, and, and coaching in Holland? Uh, uh, the of course the cultural differences. Uh, my my I was the so the, the layout was we had the U nines we had the best players of the country. All the 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 clubs they would have uh, they would have to give the permission to aspire that all the players would be in aspire to do the sessions five times a week. However, five five sessions with U nine players is a bit too much. So all the kids they were invited to come five times, but they could come three times. They could come four times. We would play inner squad matches on a Thursday because Friday, Saturday is the weekend. And on Saturdays, they would play with their own clubs within a league. Right. And then... So, so, the, say, so, you say, so you say five times a week. What was the training schedule? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Yeah, Sunday, Friday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Wow. But the kids were not allowed. Well, they were allowed to come five times a week. Some of the yeah. kids, they would come five times. But I think the predominantly, I think it would be like three times a week, four times a week. We would have... Because within Aspire, all the facilities were there. We would have futsal, we would have gymnastics, we would have judo. Uh, mm. It was a big, big, big program. And with the with the U9s, I, I, had, an, I had a full-time assistant coach, I had a full-time team manager. There was a, a full-time video analyst. It was almost like a very professional environment around these kids. But these kids, most of these kids, they were uh, going to school early morning. They would start at maybe 6.30 and then they would be home at 1.00. The afternoon they would have off because it was too hot and then the session would start around 4 p.m in the afternoon so the day of the kids was quite long and you could definitely see that uh the rhythm and the intensity i was demanding was a little bit in the beginning it was a little bit too much because it was difficult to adapt because i come from a background where the kids really want to be there and they pursue their dream to be a professional football player those kids didn't come there necessarily to be a professional football player they came there to have a good time and they were selected and most of the parents were happy to send the boys to Aspire because the quality of Aspire was a little bit higher than within the clubs, uh, especially if you look at the other players, because in the clubs it's, it's a little bit differently organized. It's not that the best players play with the, with the best players, which was, in a, uh, which was in Aspire. So it was a different environment, but the dreams of the boys were also a little bit different than the dreams of the boys in Holland or in Europe. Some of the boys, their, their dream was not so much to be that professional football player, but they just want to have a good time. Yeah, yeah interesting. And how many players did you have in your under nine squad? It, uh, it could be anywhere in between. There would be on the on the roster would be twenty five. Sometimes right. all twenty five would show up. Sometimes we would have uh, visitor players. Like the, so I, I was lucky that in my team, I there was also foreign players. It's like the 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 son of the uh, national team coach was there. I had the, one of the relatives of Xavi Hernandez, the coach of Barcelona, oh, wow. in the team. So he would come watch sessions together with Mido, the former striker, the Egyptian striker. Mm. Was also, so they would watch my sessions. So it was, I spent, I think, one year every, I think they came on a Wednesday, they would give feedback after the session. And then I would have fantastic discussions about, like in Barcelona, they didn't do any curve. So I would, with, the, with Xavi and his brother, we would have discussions about all my crazy curve stuff. Because this is not mm -hmm. how uh, the boys should learn how to play football. They should do passing. They should play rondos. So yeah, yeah, was, yeah. I learned so much just from talking to them and being with them uh, for a longer period of time, talking about the game and talking about how I see things as a Dutch stubborn young coach. It brought in my my philosophy. I think now that I, I'm not I'm not that Dutch anymore. I have the ability now to see that whatever is happening in the rest of the world is also could be also be very good. So I hope that's what is going to happen in Holland now, that we're going to actually take in things from outside as well. And so like you train 4.30, that'd be outside, would it? I mean, obviously, you know, I'm in a hot climate now. So I assume, yeah. is that indoor or outdoors? So then, yeah, I mean, that's still going to be still pretty hardcore, still quite hot and you know, humid outside well, for, most of the yeah, year around. 
but we were lucky because of the Ramadan. The timing of the Ramadan was in May. When I came, right. it was June and May, so we would have that summer off because of the Ramadan. Yeah. Uh, and the other times, it was it, it, it would be around uh, 30 degrees. Sometimes it would be 40. Yeah. But if it was too hot, we would be indoor. There's a dome. There's the biggest pie dome. Um, but the difficult times for the boys was December because it, it could go down to like 18 degrees. And 18, that's sweaters, that's wearing gloves, that's wearing hats. It was super cold for them. We would travel. Yeah, it's, to like, it's like summer in England, but it doesn't matter. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we would travel to Cyprus and that was, right. it, it, it was four degrees and they were thinking about canceling the session. Oh, wow. It was too cold. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So I mean, just, then just tell I mean, what was the main differences in terms of, you know, when you're putting on a session, I mean, you, you talked about that high intensity sort of stuff with the, with the ball work. You want, was it, was there any, was there any difference there in terms of, you know, how you could coach the players? Was it climb with the climate like that, or just in terms of how the players were in terms uh, of intensity? Well, regarding the, the, the climate, of course, because th there had to be a lot of water breaks and yeah. uh, it is not, not, it is not good in the culture to rush and to drink quickly. So we would need, we had to take time to give them a water break and they would actually drink. But the good thing was that was prayer time because the prayer is, was always when, uh, when sun sets, which was in the session. So the boys would go to pray. And during that time, it was like, almost like, it's like a meditation because the boys would be very enthusiastic. They would have a lot of fire within them. Then they would go to prayer. And after prayer, they would come back relaxed. It was like, it refreshed their brain also. To wow. be able to, so it was, especially if the, if the prayer was in the middle of the session, the session, the quality yeah. of the end of the session was higher. Um, re regarding coaching, it was, the boys were a little bit more edgy sometimes because they had such long days. So mm -hmm. all my feedback, my criticism had to be wrapped. It should be like a gift. It's like the, we, we, and I think in Holland, we call it the sandwich. I give you a compliment, I give you a little bit of criticism and I give you another compliment. In Qatar, that yeah. was very important to make sure you do that. And of course, the relationship with the boys was uh, uh, was difficult. I, I had the luxury that I spoke Arabic quick, that I li look a little bit like them with my beard and my brown mm. eyes. So I was yeah. I was accepted quite quite easily within the community. So the boys were listening very good to me, which could also be a, a challenge if they don't respect you, uh, which doesn't have to do anything with your quality of coaching, but how you are as a as a person. Uh, how you and what, and, what, and, and what sort of if, you know what sort of players were they compared to what the you know if you typical sort of Qatari foundation phase player compared to a Dutch player or an English player or whatever? Uh, that's a difficult question because the the Qatari boys they are uh, there's a big 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 variety within them. It right. would be it would there's only four hundred thousand of them. So that would be born. I think there were six thousand boys were born uh, who were able to play for us for the uh, for the national team because they need to have a Qatari passport, otherwise they could not be within the within the squad. Um, we would have the 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 creative midfielder. We would have that. We would have that strong defender, but we could hardly find a good goalkeeper because the goalkeepers looked upon as a little bit the. Like we would have it on the streets back in the days. If you really can play, you'll be a goalkeeper, which is still a big thing in Qatar. The goalkeeper is usually the kid who's there, who's just a little bit not physically fit enough yeah. or really can't play. So the goalkeeper is always a difficult thing. And we would have all the boys really wanted to be number 10 because they always wanted to be the creative, the important player. They all wanted to be yeah. the the captain of the everyone, team. Everyone wants to be the 10, right? It's just the yeah. uh, same everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so then tell us about the, your, how long you were in Qatar for? Three years. And so then tell us about then how the, the PSV uh, role came about. Uh, so there was a, Edorta Muroa came, who was the technical director of Atletico Bilbao. And he worked in Chile. He came to Aspire Academy. And uh, it was an interesting time. I learned a lot, but it was just not, not my cup of tea. He, uh, we were, we were obliged to do, sessions with the boys which i think was too difficult for the boys they were not engaged enough so i decided this is not for me i'd rather leave so i decided to leave in the winter i spoke with a few people that i that i was going to leave i told the spy that i was going to leave so it was quite open and at that time i spoke to uh, one of the guys who was uh, coaching at psv in the fundament and in the fundament the philosophy at that time was that they're just kids who can play really really good football but they're just kids so it's important that we limit the time in the car and that they have a social life as well and i in my opinion that is super important because we have that responsibility that the boys 
I will be successful people. And successful is that, not. So, so that's what, what what age group is that you're talking about? This the is the, this is you that starts you, at you you ten to you twelve, right? Okay. Uh, which is uh, the youngest ages, which I which I think is the most fun. I really yeah. do not fancy coaching the U18s or something like that. Uh, so I spoke with PSV about that, but I didn't really want to come back to Holland. I wanted to stay abroad because I was uh, really happy with all the different uh, learning opportunities I was getting. It was a little bit more diverse. Uh, but then uh, the talk with PSV, because I did talk to them, it was a very good talk and they were very, the philosophy I really, 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 really liked. And then I was like, okay, I really need to do my A license as well. <laughs> So I thought I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll do that one year, two years, work at PSV, do my A license and then go abroad again. But then when I stayed there for one year, I really liked it. I did the A license and I resigned. Uh, then I signed another contract. So I stayed, I stayed there for three and a half years. And so what was your role going in there? <laughs> well, I started, my first role was U11 coach uh, in yeah. one of the centers. After two months, I was the assistant coach of the 13s. And then at the end of that se uh, season, I was the skills coach for the entire fundament. Then the next wow. year, I was the skills coach with fundament. It's it's about 108 players. Uh, so the in the next season, I was the lead skills coach with the and with the 13s again, and I was the coordinator of well-being, which we don't have in Holland. It doesn't exist. Well-being and all that type of stuff is just not there. So I was I think the only welfare coordinator, well-being coordinator in Holland. I did oh. that for three years, and then in the summer, this summer I I was I was the thirteen coach. So let's go back there. So you said the fundament, which it says is tens till twelves, is that correct? And then so you said you're 108 players in there. So that, I assume that's all around different centres and stuff, as well as yeah. the how's that? Tell us about the structure. How does that work the, with the academy in terms of the structure of the lower age groups? There's a there's a main hub which is in Eindhoven <laughs> because PSV is based in Eindhoven. That's the main hub yeah. where the big facility is, and then. There is uh, uh, four locations around Eindhoven in the southern part of Holland uh, to limit the driving uh, time for the boys. So let's say there's one about an hour away from Eindhoven. So all the kids, they have to, it's two hours less driving. We work together with local amateur clubs. At that amateur club, we tell them, is it okay if we take your pitch from like for four days, two hours? They would say, okay, what do we get from that? We will help your coaches. We, you can watch every session. And we will work together with you. Then the center starts. So on a Monday, let's say Rosmalen, which is close to, U close to Utrecht. The benefit for PSV is that all the boys who could potentially go play at FC Utrecht, but really would be interested in playing for PSV, they will we'll take the, uh, the argument away that they have to be in the car, that they have to drive so far. And for PSV, it's good because then the scouting area gets bigger. So then, so, the then what, what, the, so, what, so how does that work then practice? So then they, they're in that center. At yeah. what point do, do they get in? If you like them, do they go in the academy? Uh, well, <laughs> everyone is, the fundament is already considered the academy. So it's all, wow. you're already a member of PSV. You play for PSV. They started uh, without playing without any logo of PSV to reduce the pressure. But I think that was after one year, the logos came back and everything. So they are officially already PSV players. They are part of the academy on a day throughout the week they have the sessions there but on a match day they would play together with all the locations they would be mixed so on every right. location there's a u10 a u11 u12 on a saturday they were being mixed it could be that one location plays together with another location they play against fine art it could also be that uh they choose all the tall players to play together against let's say another club but then on the 13th all the players they come to eindhoven they go to school in eindhoven uh, they have all the sessions in Eindhoven. So there's a big dropout from the U12s to the U13s because there's like maybe 42 U12 players and 25 are selected to play in the U13s. And then, and then they, they go in the 13s, so they go to school. So they go to, they go to the PSV school, the chosen school. They all go to school together. Yes. And uh, this is a bit, of a bit of a thing because they all, they're all also in the same class. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's not it's not the PSV school. It's a top sports school. It's a regular school, but they do yeah. all the athletes go there. So they'll they'll be in the class with people who swim on a high level or horseback riding that's, on a high level. That's really interesting. So then, what? How much access do the coaches get to those boys in the thirteens? How how much? What's their track typical training week? Uh, it would be a Monday afternoon. 
it would be a Tuesday morning, the Wednesday off, Thursday morning, Friday afternoon, Saturday match day. Wow, interesting. So in the school, the time in school is limited. They don't have PE, they don't have music, they don't have drama. All of the creative classes, they're not there. Uh, so it's just limited to the basic amount, what they have to do. So and what happens? Together. And what, what happens if maybe one player drops below the level? And do, would you release players or they, they have a certain commitment once they join the school? How does that work? Or do you bring other players in? What's the, how, does, how does that work? Um, uh, that is a, I think that's, a, that's one of the things which is a little bit weird in Holland. If the club doesn't like a player, he can be released anytime. You're not responsible for the school or anything anymore. So it right. could happen that let's say you are <laughs> living two hours away from Eindhoven. Yeah. Uh, you go to school in Eindhoven for the 13th. Yeah. And then you'll be released after one year. You have to find a new school close to your home. Yeah. That's because quite, these boys, that's they stay with, <laughs> and these boys yeah. stay, stay with host families because the session in the morning starts at nine. So you cannot yeah. go home. Uh, there's no transportation organized. They travel by themselves with uh, public transportation. They take buses. So then, or... so, so all thirteens have to go to that school program. Then that's that's uh, not non non negotiable. Uh, yes, it depends. There's a few people who manage to find a way around it, but it, yeah, I think you have to be a little bit lucky. Sometimes it, it has to do with your schooling. Like if you go to a special special school, there's one of the yeah. boys who has a uh, his, his Dutch was not good enough, so he went. He is going to uh, to a school to learn to speak better Dutch because he comes from another country. Then, of course, that's not an issue. But if you want to okay. be, if you want to attend all the sessions, you have to be at that school because the other schooling programs they don't they they will not help you that much. Interesting. So let's co- let's come back to the things in a minute. Let's go back to the fundament and um, your work with them. Tell us a bit about the the coaching philosophy in those that age group, and give us some ideas. You know, typical session that sort of thing. Those players, what, you, what sort of stuff you're delivering. Um, well, my role within that was I would never do the entire session. So I would be, let's say on a Monday, I was in Eindhoven. It would be the U- U10s, U11s, U12s would be training. I would be the first 45 minutes, I would be with the U10s. Then the next 45 minutes, I would be with the U11s. And then the next 45 minutes, I would be, be with the U12s. The ses- session would be around two, two and a half hours, which is, of course, quite long. Uh, then with me, they would usually they would play chaos. We play 2v1, 3v2, 1v1, those types of things with shooting and finishing. And there would be maybe 10 minutes of isolated skills on a post within. And then they would go to the, the other coach. There would be a circuit. So they would be possibly be with me. They would go to one other coach would do a positioning game. Another coach would do another positioning game. And there would be another positioning game. And then in the end, they would play matches together. But the, the boys could be split as well. So it would not necessarily be an age it could also be based on how tall you are. Maybe your weight could be on your, whatever you want to, your area of improvement. Sometimes the, all the dribblers were put together, all the kids who have more of that thing for passing, they would be all put together. Um, so my role was coaching all of them. And uh, within that part, I was, also in, I was also trying to make sure that all the boys were feeling okay. Some of the boys, they didn't speak Dutch that well. So... Uh, with my background speaking multiple languages, I was uh, trying to help them also sometimes to understand whatever the coaches were saying or stuff like that. So you talk about the immigrant, the immigrant, immigrant community. And yeah, yeah, but also some of the players. Coming. Yeah, but also we had, we had some, there were a lot of Belgian kids and a lot of the Belgian right. kids, they, uh, uh, most of them, did, they did speak Dutch, but some of the parents, they didn't speak any Dutch. They would only speak French. Some of the boys, they would only speak uh, that the Dutch would not be that good. So they would not understand certain words, especially uh, football specific words could sometimes be a little bit difficult. We would also have some Belgian coaches at PSV and they would also use words. We, we speak the same language, but the football words are not the same. Mm-hmm. We would say, just go into a square. They would say, you need to infiltrate in a square. So all, <laughs> yeah. So all those little things, it was and that 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 cultural sensitivity that was a that was yeah. a big thing as well, of course. And, and you, you talk about then your your chaos games and the your one v one, your two v ones, your three v twos. Talk a little bit about your overload games, your two v ones, your three v twos. Can you cover some of the sort of the principles and the details you're delivering in those games, or are you just letting them play and just uh, figure out themselves? Uh, of course, there is the my all my explanation is done with the rules. So let's say my emphasis would, would, would be on the uh, uh, oriented control on the first touch towards the goal. I would, I would we, we play two v one with big goals and I would say, uh, you can only score if you touch the ball twice. 
So you, your first touch and your shot, you cannot score with a one touch. You cannot score if you touch it more than twice. You can do how many touches, however you want within the game. But if you want to score, it can only be two touches. So my all my explanation was done with the rules. Then within the game, I would do give individual feedback to the boys. I would hardly do it in the team because with the other coaches, it would be on how they work together. With me, when they were with me, it was all individual. So let's say one of the boys did, he had a touch and he scored a goal. After that, I would go to him and I would tell him, wow, that was a very good touch. What happened there? And then he would say, oh, something like this. And I would say, okay, nice, because you put your toe up. It went in front of you. You didn't wait for the ball. So it was positive. It was uh, not always telling them what to do. It was using the rules to explain what was what they needed to do. And it was a lot of... Uh, uh, if my explanation was that within the team, it would not be telling them what to do. It would be asking some questions, 10 seconds, and they would play on. I would use a lot of my, the, well, humor is a big word, but I would use a lot of my jokes to make them think all the time. So they would be very high intensity. It would, they really wanted to win. They would be kicking each other. I would make one of my jokes. They would be out of the concentration. They would be puzzled. Then we would play again mm. because I think it's important that they are on, that they're focused and they're not focused all the time. So is that and so you change? Said, and you said the out the session was two and a half hours. Exactly. And then that's yeah. I remember when I visited Ajax pre-COVID a few years ago, they they extended their sessions. Not uh, you know they had a similar. I was like, wow, that's a long session. We don't get sessions like that in England. And they all said, uh, I asked them why they did. They said, well, you want to get there. Just, they've, they've introduced more movement, sort of multi-sport stuff, and they didn't want to take away from the football quite interesting is that you know is that common now in holland having sessions that that length and throughout the week um, it's, i would not say it's common but it's happening a little it's happening more and more um if you would ask my feedback about that i think at the last hour especially if the intensity is too high the players are doing whatever the coaches tell them to do because they have to do it they lost maybe the really energy to really enjoy themselves. So I would, I would not be, I'm, I'm not a big fan of those long sessions. I'm a fan of sometimes long sessions is fine, but I think, like I said, I think it has to do with the variety. Sometimes to do an hour and 15 minutes is good enough also because it, it, it all comes down to whatever you're doing on the pitch is it really helping them to get a better player or is it something you're going to do to make sure that you tick all the boxes as a coach. Um, and what sort of how what was, how does the club work in terms of like a curriculum? Is it quite specific in terms of what it wants you to deliver, or as a as a coach you have the freedom to do that? I mean, I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. Right. It also came with the job with, with my role. Yeah. And it I think it also came it also happened because I'm uh, because the, the the chaos games the way I I'm doing them no one else was doing them, so I was the mm -hmm. only one who was doing that, and they all the the, the other coaches really enjoyed it. The kids really enjoyed it. They learned, they got a lot from it, but also the people within the club, they, they got a lot from it. Cause I was always do, I was also doing them with the 16s and the 17s and with the older ages as well. So, it, so when you say, the, so just like the little small sided games you're talking about, a lot of different yeah. variations, different sort of, you know, overload, underloaded, 1v1s, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, can, like, you give us like a tip, can you give us a typical one? What's one of your favorite practices like that? Uh, well, it's hard to draw a picture, but there's like just two halves. On each half, there's yeah. two goals. Yeah. So you, there's, it is on the pitch, it is 2v1. You can score a goal if you complete a pass on the same half to your teammate, but then you have to score on the opposing goal. So let's right. say you dribble to the other half to score a goal, but if you make a pass there, you cannot score on that goal. You have to go to the other side again because you just earned the right to go score on the other half again. Right, okay. And then when the ball goes out or it's a goal, uh, the new team starts and whoever touched the ball last is defending or whoever didn't touch the ball last is defending or whoever started with the ball is defending. So it's, it goes up and down all the time. And then if I change the rules quickly, you can tell like a one, you can always score a one touch finish or you, the, if the assist is a one touch, it's worth double points. So it's confusing them all the time with bringing the chaos in their brain. So their focus is not so much on the, uh, uh, on the performing, uh, on how they perform the skill. Because they lose that, the contact with the feet because they're thinking on how, yeah. how do I get so many yeah. points? What are the rules again? So because yeah, of that's, that, yeah, you want the players there, you know, thinking, well, this is this is what's going on here. So, you know, yeah. they're out and of the then, comfort zone, right? And then he comes with one of his stupid jokes, and then the kids are distracted again. Mm, yeah, 
then it's then it's again it's another type of chaos again so it's all the time it's changing and because of that change they are into it and they have to listen it's not an environment if you make a mistake we're laughing at you but it happened a lot that when a 14 year old scores an own goal and he's celebrating because he he forgot one of the rules or because he wasn't really getting it that mm. those those are that's the, the environment you want that the boys are still thinking they're playing they're learning that it's high intensity uh, and my job as a coach is is just making sure that they are uh, uh, they're enjoying themselves because when they enjoy it, those types of exercises they're learning is that the holy grail is that what everyone should do all the time no could it be a benefit to help uh, the boys perform yes it's like everything too much of that is not good yeah balance right and yeah. it's, it's about then your role as the 13s then what was how was that just you were the 13s were your head coach of the 13s yeah. Still, skills coach. What was what was different about that role, and you know the challenges there? Uh, well, that was a. Uh, uh, this is the part where I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, just I mean, just I mean, in terms of, I mean, so you become a head coach then, did you? Is that is that your? Uh, would you be head coach of thirteens? You said. Yeah. So then, so I mean, so then, I mean, obviously, then it, you're going from just delivering the those your skills and the character, and you have to deliver a wider. Yeah, a bigger part of the curriculum, and so that's the question, isn't it? So, what sort of things are you delivering? Are you delivering, you know, more tactical elements and things like that? It would be uh, uh, so that transition was there, especially for the for, so for the players in the beginning it was a little bit. They had to get used <clears> to it. That the fact that I was not doing only the fun chaos anymore, that I was also doing positioning games, but even within my positioning games or in my all my tactical work, it would always be based on high intensity. It would always be based on scoring goals, and so that my my role as a coach didn't change that much just the fact that i would stop the pause the game more stop stand still that types of that type of things that the, it was uh for me it was fine because i'm used to coaching teams but for the boys they only knew me as the skills coach mm -hmm. uh, it was uh it, it they need to get used to it so regarding the sessions it would be uh i would like to split the group because there was about 21 players so i would like to split the group in two halves one group would do skills work or would do uh, performance or would do multi-skills and the other group would do a positioning game so a lot of that so to minimize to maximize the attention and to maximize the amount of touches on the ball instead of having like the big 7v8 positioning games which i think is of course good but not on when you're 13 you just need to touch the ball a lot i think and that's my opinion so i would, yeah. I would try to mirror the sessions and stuff like that so then, so so when the when the players get to thirteen, what's what's format are they playing? What's how many a side are they playing in that? It is. Are they eleven v eleven? Yeah, it's well, it is it is eleven v eleven, and they come from eight v eight, eight v eight across right. the like on a half pitch. They go to eleven v eleven, so they have to, or they have to. They uh, it's that time where they get used to the big pitch, but also it's the time in Holland where you change schools, and it's also the time where you, as a twelve year old, where you were close to your home, having your sessions, you move to Eindhoven. So it was the it is the age with the with the big changes. Everything is changing. Mm. Uh, so the first six weeks is just the boys need to get used to how to take the train. It's how to get like to how how do you use your energy on the eleven v eleven pitch, but also how what is it like if you're if you're on the bench? There was a thirteen one and a thirteen two squat. Uh, let's say you're in the thirteen two squat. How are you going to deal with that? Because it's not nice to be in the thirteen two because everybody wants to be in the thirteen one. How are you going to deal with that setback? So it was the first until I think until November, until I was in, in office and in, in, in that role, it was just making sure that the boys were getting used to all these new experiences and making sure that it would be uh, that I could guide them and help them with all these new experiences. Also playing on the big pitch because we would mm -hmm. play we would play uh, 11 v 11. And of course, being one of the best clubs, it's it's uh, it's not always easy to play against the other uh, the other teams because they really don't want to lose some of them they would play they would go back all the way they would play four or two and they would be defending around the box so to find to make it difficult for the boys we had to find i thought i had to find solutions to make it difficult for them so they would not play on the position they would be the best at uh, they would play in a position where they would learn more they would i would try to play them in a formation which was difficult for them because i think it's important that we challenge them winning games is fun and I truly think that it could help the team if you win games, but in the end, it's, there's no team who ever made his first team debut. It's always individual players. So how does that individual 
relate to the team, of course, but how does that individual learn the most? I think if it's a challenging environment where winning matches is not the most important thing, but having difficult matches, stress games where you learn the most, that's the most important thing. And what about how do you, how do you, and how does how your session reflect the difficulty of going from 8v8 to 11v11? You talked about that, you know, going onto a bigger pitch. So what does that, you know, how does that affect and what you're delivering and what, what are you delivering to help the players get through that, that process on the pitch, that transition? Uh, in the beginning, we would, we, would, uh, we would play in the direction the pitch was going to be because we would play touchline to touch, uh, sideline to sideline. 8v8 and touch center touch yeah. and big net to big net is the 11v11. So we would play that direction a little bit more. We would play in a, in a bigger area, try to enlarge the space. Uh, but other than that, I would not try to help them that much. Because I think th if they play on it, they'll, they'll find a way to make it work. Uh, it's not age specific. The pitch is way too big. So there's nothing really I can do to make it more uh, age appropriate. Like in, like in the UK, with that, uh, with the dimensions and everything, because in Holland we don't do that. The pitch is it's too big to play 11 v 11. So that's in the in the formation. I always try to what you try to do is to make at least four lines. So you would have the goalkeeper, defenders. I would have two defensive midfielders, two attacking midfielders, and then three strikers, because at least then the pitch is not that big anymore, but it's still too big. So hopefully they'll the game for me will reconsider this and maybe go to the German format. In Germany, they would do before winter with the 13s, they would play 9v9, then they would go to 11v11. But in the ideal world, we would, do, we would follow the UK way where the dimensions of the pitches are uh, age appropriate. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I always notice that in Holland, actually, big spaces, like yeah. the SM7, the ABA and the tournaments and yeah. big pitches. Yeah, it's quite it's, interesting. It's, it's uh, for for the coaches who think the 13s are already the Champions League. It's fun because it looks like the real game. But if you look at yeah. the way the boys play the game, it's not the real game. Because if you lose as a striker, if you lose the ball in the box and one of the defenders boots it forward, that sprint is yeah. 30 meters. It's 40 meters. No way you can ever get the ball. But then the coach is yelling at them, yeah, uh, you, you, transition, transition. So they, the boys run, but they really have no chance of getting the ball back. So that reflects on the game. And also benefits the physical players, right? Those players who have that athletical ability at an okay. early age. I suppose the overmaturated players that really they they have the advantage. And then if you're focused on winning, those boys typically would be the ones playing. And then the kids who are, we, we call them the futures, they would have less opportunity. So yeah. that's why that, that, that that's one of the other reasons why I think that big pitch is not really helping all the boys. And and so what's that look like? I mean, tell us about you talked about your A license. What what's the, what is the Dutch? You know the Dutch. Um, the coaching courses. What, what's that? In, what's that encouraging you to do? Is that? You know, what, I mean, what's the, the Dutch coaching philosophy? Were they giving you on your on your B license, your A license? Is it the same? Is it, it like COVID type stuff or the tactical no. stuff? I heard like a lot more decision making, big formats stuff. I've heard recently. Yeah, it is. It is. And uh, I was. Uh, they they changed because I did my C license maybe ten years ago, and then you had to do whatever the KFB was telling you to do. Yeah. So it was like you play 4v4, you play 7v7, you play positioning games, you learn the game to play the game. So uh, Curva was not there, it didn't exist. Um, you play 4-3-3, all of that. In the B license, it was already a little bit changing, but my A license, it was more that... So let's say one of my... You, you would be in a group of eight. I would be with one of my, one of the other coaches, was my buddy. You worked at Willem Twee. I would go to him to watch uh, his session and then... He would tell me why he was doing the type of stuff and what, what, what that club was trying to do, tell about the philosophy. And then the teacher would be there, like guiding our discussion. So instead of just focusing on whatever the KNVB was trying to teach us, it was more about what did I want to, what, what did I want to learn? I was interested in how they treated or how they work with the, uh, the spatial awareness in that club. So I could ask, the, I, I would... Uh, uh, propose five questions we would have a discussion i would tell the coach the coach would reply and then the teacher would be there guiding that discussion so it was the course was individual so it was i really enjoyed it a lot and of course there were some things what you had to do we had to do of course a session on the pitch we would coach a game which would be uh, just criteria but other than that we had the opportunity to learn more from each other from the other coaches and to learn from the teachers and that would be that it, it would more be like a conference based on individual learning with all tailor-made. So that was, that, was a, that was a big plus for me.
yeah, they, they've similar stuff going on in England at the moment. My A license was much more, you know, collaborative, if you like, and, you know, kind of give and see. And then when we're doing my advanced youth and originally I thought, actually, I was quite critical. I said, well, hang on, you know, you're the federation here. We want you to give us, you should be telling us what to do. But then reflecting, you know, thinking about sort of the clubs that are in the room. I was at Chelsea at the time. You have Man City, yeah. Liverpool, the big clubs. Everyone has a different philosophy. So it's an opportunity to come and learn from all these different clubs, I suppose, right? Exactly. And the luxury we had, we had like, because uh, this is COVID times, but we still had, when the uh, regulations were a little bit softer, we would have days in Zeist in the headquarters. There would be someone from the Federation explaining something. And then we would have, we would walk to the next classroom and you would walk with a coach you maybe you didn't even know. And even those talks, they would so be so beneficial because you would both reflect on things. And then he would say, oh, this is the way we do it at my club. I would say, this is the way we do it at my club. It would be, it, it was, it was a really, I really enjoyed the course and I think I, I got a lot from it. And I was happy that I did it in Holland and I didn't uh, do it maybe in the Middle East. And, and, and so what about when you're, when you're playing, you know, PSV against final or the PSV against Ajax, what's that like for, you know, the, the academy, the parents, the coach? I mean, you know, we've all, you know, in England, we, you know, my first career, my first job was at Tottenham. We played Tottenham against Arsenal, you know, it's yeah. a North London derby. That's a yeah. lot of fun. I'm not going to lie. Okay. Yeah. It's, easy, it's easy to get caught up in the emotion as a young coach and that, you know. Exactly. Exactly. In Holland, it, 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 it is the same. It is the same. And, but in Holland, the parents are allowed on the pitch. Not on the pitch, but watch the, watch the game. I was uh, visiting Arsenal and we went to play City in uh, St. George's Park. And the only person there was the bus driver. Yeah. In Holland, there, yeah. was, there would be maybe like 100, 100 people, everyone shouting. There would be uh, a referee and the ref everyone would be shouting at the referee the coach would be shouting at the referee the players would be very aggressive but it it's changing a little bit to the good i think because the matches i've played against ix or the matches i've played against Feyenoord, the vibe was always good not with the parents not on the not with the the players on the pitch but as coaches it depends a little bit how you treat it for me it, to me it's not the champions league final to me, these yeah. are the games we want to play. These are the best games because they are giving the challenge the players need. They're giving the challenge we as a coach want. So we should be happy that we are going to play against such a difficult team, that we play fine with, that we play AZ, that we play Ajax. To my opinion, we should play them every week. Mm. And we should not be uh, focused so much on winning those games, but just that is the challenge we need. So Yeah, I think it's the same as when I was, you say, like, look, we're one of the biggest clubs in the country or in London. You're the biggest clubs. Who's got the best players? Who's got the best program? You know, that's a challenge. You want to see, you know, you yeah. want to go up against the best and challenge yourself and your exactly. players against the best players, right? Yeah, and it doesn't, to me, in my opinion, it doesn't matter if I, I'm not a good coach if I win that match. Yeah. That is not, for me, the ultimate goal. The ultimate yeah. goal is in 10 years, maybe one of two of those boys, they made the first team. And all the other boys they are successful in whatever they do. Maybe they are, they play in a lower level. Maybe they, they don't play anymore, but as long as they can reflect on a very good time. And can you just imagine that environment that you wear the logo of one club and you play against the biggest rival of the other club, you've been on that pitch. That is a life lesson. You can use your entire life. But if we only, if the end result, if we win, it's a good lesson. If we lose, it's a wrong lesson. We didn't take, we didn't take the full aspect of what it's like to be on that pitch. And is that pretty much across the academy there, that, I, that approach to winning and losing and taking part at a young age? Or does it change when it gets older? Or is it from coach to coach? Coach to coach. Right, it is okay. coach to coach. And uh, uh, with some coaches, it also depends a little bit on the moment. Let's say if you're about, if your contract is maybe about to be, uh, how do you call that? When you're, contract is almost done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah then some people they get a little more anxious they think they have to win to renew the contract wow. yeah yeah that of course that happens but looking from the outside i was in uruguay i, I watched Peñarol. they play against uh, uh, torque which is now owned by one of the city uh, city group uh the parents were in cages they were police with dogs uh the parents were in like there was really like a net around it because the, the parents would throw rocks and everything it is and the wow. coaches the coaches that would be a fourth official with the 14th we are that's not happening in holland we are it's not that crazy yeah. but still it is very intense which is in a way it's good but 
it would be, I think it would be good for some people to reflect on it and think, is it really, am I doing this for myself or is, is this really to help the boys? Yeah, I mean, I remember when I got more experience and my time at Chelsea and I'd, I'd got used to those occasions, you'd almost try and downplay the occasion and say, look, it's just another game. We want to win. You know, yeah. Who's got the best players? We want to prove we're better than this lot. We don't really like them. It's fine, but it's a normal game. It's not like a battle. And there's the parents, like say, on the side to uh, yeah. <laughs> who generally are the, the more. Yeah. And we had, uh, had a... Like someone from who's at Lazio who came on the show and he they don't, they won't play Roma they don't play Roma because it's too uh, violent <laughs> on the sidelines but they say so we don't not in England we're not that we're not that bad yet at the moment yeah <laughs> yeah that so, is so, go on no go on so yeah so what about yourself then so now obviously you've 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 left PSV what what's what's your ambitions for the future where would you where would you like to go with your career uh, the good thing is that I really know what I don't want to do I don't want to coach your first team. I don't want to coach the U18s. So I want to work with the uh, younger ages because that's what I like to do the most. That's what I think is the most fun. Uh, I would like to, uh, I'm ready for, for, for like a good challenge and a good challenge in my opinion could be a new language and a new culture. I don't speak Turkish, maybe working in a Turk in the Turkish club. I don't speak Greek. My Spanish Portuguese is not that good. Why not go to Brazil mm. and speak Portuguese in Brazil, work in a Brazilian club or do I or do I want to take my experiences from the last years working abroad and my PSV experience working at another Dutch club? Because I think there's so many things that we can take from that. Uh, so it's just it's it, it's open. I'm not I'm not really I, I really know what I don't want to do, which is first teams and anything regarding that. And then what I mean, what about then in the future though? You think you're you're always going to be you'd always like to remain working with younger age groups, or would you see eventually maybe? You know, doing more of a management position, the head of academy or that sort of thing. Yeah, I think when I get older, <laughs> when, I'm, when, I, when I get older, that's, I think that's where, I, where I'm going to go. But I'm not sure if, I got, if I'm going to go to the head of academy type of management type of things. I was coordinating uh, phases in, in my previous clubs and everything. I did like to do that, but I don't really see myself like head of academy because that it's also about a lot of money. It's also about who's doing the pitches and it's all about the stuff which is important, but it's not really what I think I'm good at. I'd rather see myself working uh, in the club within the, uh, in the uh, well-being part, maybe making sure that everything is going well in that, in, in that aspect. Maybe I'll, I'm going to uh, be the assistant of the first team coach with, in a club with different cultures in a team where there's multiple languages, maybe maybe that's my, when I get old, maybe that's where I want to go. But now I'm happy coaching U14s, U13s and U8s, all that, because that's what, that's yeah. what I, that's the pure football for me. Because the, these yeah. kids, they play, they, they lose 10-2, but if they score two goals, they're happy. And, and, and how do you develop yourself? How do you keep at the cutting edge of the game? How, how do you make sure that you're, you're always, you know, you're, you're fresh and what you're delivering is always relevant. Uh, I, because like, if I look back at, because I left PC three weeks ago, the last two weeks I've been at three different clubs doing sessions, oh, wow. uh, three other professional clubs in Holland. I know people there, so they invite me if I wanted to come. So I go there, I coach. And then when I'm there, I'm not only coaching myself, I also make, make sure I see sessions of the other coaches as well and I that, that's what I try to do but also what I really like to do is stay in touch with the all my colleagues who I've worked with before because the good thing about football is everyone is always uh it's always changing there's always new things coming up so the more I speak with different people like you mentioned like Joe Roma I work with an Italian coach in uh in Aspire we still speak every six months because we started the same day and there's always something new he saw in Italy there's always something new he heard uh, so it's just it's just a lot about that, but it's also uh, like now trying to use my time to travel, trying to go to new places, uh, but also making sure that I still love what I like, that I just do what I like to do. So I coached uh, at amateur clubs. There was a kid who didn't speak Dutch, came from Yemen. The coach didn't speak any Arabic, so I went there. I coached the the like really not the best teams in the world amateur level because I think it's also important for me to uh, make sure that my reality PSV is not reality PSV is like a dream every the quality of the kids quality of my, co my colleagues the quality of the facility everything 
So that's not for any, that's not for everyone. I should be grateful that I've that, that I've been there such a long time. So I should also make sure that I contribute, that I give back. That's why for me, coaching anyone, anyone in any way, I'm not I'm not that type of coach who is only elite. That who, who I only, I want to work at the best clubs in the world. No, I can. My 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 fun is in coaching, not in coaching the best people and best kids in the world only. And what advice would you give to a young coach who wanted to have a, a, a full-time quality career in the game like yourself? I think it's important if you find out what your own superpower is, what your weapon is, what makes you different from the other coaches. And it's, I think it's important as a young coach that you understand that all these kids, they have, a, they have parents, they have a mom and a dad, and you can learn so much from talking to the parents. You can learn so much from talking to your players. It's not about, it's not your show. You are not there to perform a show. You are there to make sure that the boys enjoy it or the girls, that they enjoy what they do. And you have a responsibility to make sure that they'll be successful in whatever they do. So as a young coach, it's important to understand, I think, what is my superpower? What is my weapon? What do I bring to the game, which is different? And to also understand this is not only my career. This is my responsibility. So make sure that whoever I'm coaching, they have the biggest advantage. Thomas Rusink, thank you very much, mate. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Sol. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.